Welcome to the Colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Anigal Medina Marones, who will tell us about new tools from applied topology for signal processing and thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming. We have almost a full house. Thank you so much. Uh, I will be speaking about these topics, uh, but first I would like to pause here for a moment to acknowledge the tragedy. And let me move on to the first part. I, I um, divided this into three parts. The first one is titled hyperharmonic analysis. I want to uh, get to uh, this concept in a, in a little bit, but the motivation for the uh, project that I'm going to present comes from complex systems. And in complex systems, we have this slogan that tells us that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So how do we uh, make more precise this statement? How can we transform this slogan into something quantifiable? And uh, I would propose that a way of uh, approaching this question is to use um, information theory. So let's uh, introduce some concepts from information theory. This uh, was developed originally by Shannon. And the precise definitions are not so important for uh, what I am going to do. Uh, so there might be some symbols, but we don't really need to uh, absorb them all. The setup is important for us. And this is given by a collection of probability distributions. Something to keep in mind, for example, is uh, EEG data. So we are measuring um, using um, electrical connectivity. And uh, the first concept is that to any of these probability distributions, we can assign uh, the entropy. So this concept is analogous to the one introduced by Boltzmann in statistical mechanics. In a way, it's taking an average of the amount of information that each of these possible outcomes carries. Now, this is something that we're assigning to every probability distribution, but we could also assign a meaningful concept, a meaningful quantity, to pairs of probability distributions. This is so-called Shannon mutual information. And it's defined using uh, entropy, but now using entropy of the joint probability and entropy associated to the conditional probabilities. So again, we don't have to absorb all of this, just the, just the ideas, just the, just the music. And there are generalizations um, of this concept of mutual information. In the case of triples, we have the interaction information, again, defined in terms of like an exclusion inclusion principle. And we don't have to stop here. Um, we can uh, define in m multiple ways. It's not just one definition, there are many proposed definitions, not equivalent for analogs of these quantities in um, subsets of these probability distributions that have arbitrary cardinalities. So, I'll, yep. In the case of triples, are there alternative proposals? No, this this is this is very canonical. That's right. The foreign higher, then there are, um, there's more debate among experts of what is the right uh, generalization. Yeah, suppose these functions are symmetric. Yeah. Um, now. The problem when we want to go to this level is that if we increase n, the number of subsets of a given cardinality grows exponentially. And this is an issue if we want to use these tools in practice. So this is the problem that I would like to uh, uh, tackle today. And I want to do this um, using combinatorial topology. So we can think of um, the collection of probability distributions as defining the nodes of a simplicial complex. And we're gonna then think of the information signals that I was describing before as attached to the nodes or attached to the edges spanned by two nodes or attached to the triangles uh, spanned by three nodes, et cetera, et cetera. And first, uh, we're gonna have not just a simplicial complex as illustrated here, we're gonna have uh, weighted simplicial complex that is informed by some structural properties of the data that we want to study. So uh, in the example I was mentioning, for example, we know that there are some structural properties preserved um, in, the, uh, in the positioning of, of the nodes. And now, as I said, we can think of the signals now as assigning values, real values, to um, the simplices in the associated simplicial complex. And 
in topology, we have a name for such a thing. We call them real valued cochains. So we have here entropy defining a zero cochain, mutual information defining a one cochain, interaction information a two cochains, and the higher order generalizations defining um, higher dimensional cochains. And now let's uh, consider some of the combinatorics of the simplicial complex. It's equipped with an incidence matrix. It's telling us what are the co-dimension one phases of any given simplex. And uh, using the data of the weighting, we can define um, the co-boundary matrix or the co-boundary operator as the adjunct to the boundary operator. And both of these operators are very fundamental and they both act on co-chains. So here comes the, uh, the idea of hyperharmonic analysis. Um, and it's kind of motivating by something that we're quite familiar with. For example, when we talk on the phone, um, the, uh, the speaker, it's not able to carry the fundamental note of a male voice because it's not big enough. But we still hear it clearly on the other side because we're only hearing a compressed version of this with only a few higher harmonics. So this idea of compression of signals is kind of familiar in the in the one dimensional case, but not necessarily uh, in the context that we're considering. We. Uh, so when Simon say an entropy is violent, then you need to kind of suppose that the function is applicable. Here? Yeah, real valued uh, co-chains. It just extends and then distinct them. I don't know what you mean. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, actually the, the, uh, the quantity that are interested in possible. Certainly, yes. Um, okay, so um, the idea of um, compression of signals is the one that we want to imitate here. And I already uh, mentioned um, cell phones, but this is another clear thing. Uh, in order to distinguish a, a guitar or a piano playing the same note, we only have to hear a few harmonics to distinguish their tempo. Okay, so the contribution um, that we made with uh, this gentleman uh, is a principal way of compressing high order information signals based on uh, analogous of the Fourier analysis um, in the context of combinatorial topology. So what uh, is the Fourier basis in this context? It will be given by um, the eigenvectors of a so-called discrete Laplacian. And here we're using the boundary and co-boundary operators from the previous um, section. And if we're familiar with differential geometry, we might recognize this as a direct um, analog of the Laplace Beltrami operator defined in terms of D and D star in that context. So we have here uh, this uh, operator and we define the Fourier basis to be the um, basis given by its eigenvectors. And uh, I would like to post the, uh, the uh, statement that writing things in the Fourier basis allows us to compress them much better. So before I, I uh, say that, I would like to discuss what I mean by compressibility, right? Um, so we have the canonical basis. That's the one where we computed things. Um, I'm, I want to show at the end that that's not so good for compression, but if we pass to a different basis, it's going to be good for compression. That's the tenant, that's the contribution here. Uh, but how do we measure compressibility? And if we have a signal, a co-chain, let's go ahead and write it in the basis that we are analyzing. We're gonna have a collection of um, real numbers, the coefficients in the fixed basis, and without loss of generality, let's order them such that their squares are um, decreasing. Now, the expectation value associated to the k basis element will be just the square of its associated coefficient over the total mass. Um, and I'm also going to define the cumulative. Think of, maybe I should say this a little bit of intuition. This is the total mass of the signal in a way, right? So, 
That's right. So um, here we have um, how much of that mass is carried by that particular coefficient, right? And over here, um, I'm just considering the first k um, basis elements and, and define the cumulative uh, expectation value in that way. Okay, um, so I said what the claim is. We can compress in the Fourier basis better than in the canonical basis. And let me show an example. This is not uh, a theorem type of thing. This is more like in practice type of thing. So the example comes from uh, Haydn symphonies, the so-called London symphonies. And the first thing is to um, get used to the idea of thinking about music as a collection of uh, random variables. So you can think of the score of each of the um, instruments defining uh, a frequency, a probability distribution that is based on the frequency of uh, the different notes appearing. And so how often do we play this or that? That will tell you uh, uh, a certain um, probability of that same note being seen next, right? So we extract from the symphony for every instrument um, a probability distribution. And uh, we will go ahead and compute some of this high order information signals. We're gonna be analyzing two possible generalizations to four and, and uh, to three and higher dimensions. And uh, we're gonna uh, analyze um, the situation in across four dimensions. So here's the, the money shot. In dimension um, two, three, and five, they all have the same behavior. So I'm just gonna bring your attention to one of those. As I said, we're analyzing two signals and we're comparing two bases, the canonical bases and, and the Fourier bases. Down here with the canonical um, bases and over here we see the um, Fourier ones. But what are we seeing? Well, over here we have this cumulative exponential, uh, sorry, cumulative expected value. Uh, and over here we have the number of components. So. The full signal would be when we have uh, CEV equal to one. So we're measuring how many components do we need to get close to one. So the fastest that we climb, the better in terms of compression. Because if we just drop away all of these coefficients, uh, we will see that most of the signal is retained still in the case of, uh, of the Fourier basis, but we will be losing like half of the signal if we use the canonical basis. And this is what we're seeing throughout this picture. So this is a good place to stop with. I'm gonna change the topic. Any questions, any comments? Yeah, so in this particular example, we have to use the complete simplicial complex, the, the simplex, yeah. Uh, but in other, in other examples, uh, there will be structural reasons that uh, will inform the the this this the underlying simplicial complex. Great question. So, so in this context, there is also this uh, minatorial arch theory. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, not in this work, but in other in other works, and there are some people also thinking about uh, Hodge decompositions uh, using the Laplace uh, Beltrami yeah, operator. And that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. We're going to return to cohomology in a moment. Any other comments or questions? All right. So the second part, persistent homology. And I've been told all of you are almost experts on this topic, but I'm still going to do a little bit of a review. Um, I would like to focus on the use of persistent homology first for uh, the analysis of data. And uh, the intuition here starts with the observation that data is encountered very often as in the form of a point cloud in Euclidean space. Um, the example that illustrates this uh, best, in my opinion, is to consider uh, a picture, say black and white picture, and every pixel has associated an intensity. So we can think of this uh, um, image as encoded by a vector of dimension the number of pixels. Right? So if you have a collection of pictures, then you're going to have 
not just one point as before, we're going to have a point cloud of those. Uh, something that looks like this. And I like how this pinky color is turning out things. Um, so we have now this, this uh, point cloud. And we can think in terms of probability distributions now. If our data set was completely unstructured, we would expect to see a homogeneous distribution of the points throughout uh, Euclidean space. But that's not the case, right? We are trying to get some structure in this data set. So it tends to concentrate um, around some subspaces of Euclidean space. So we can think of that there is an underlying dis probability distribution from which we're sampling the points. And that probability distribution is concentrated along some subspace. It doesn't have to be linear or anything, but um, it is of lower dimension. And typically, it is a pseudo-manifold, in fact. Now, we would like to approximate that subspace. Uh, and we're going to do it in a multi-scale fashion. So for every distance parameter, E, we're going to um, associate a simplicial complex to that distance parameter. So when epsilon is 0, we just have the original point cloud. When epsilon starts increasing, we uh, connect points whose distance is less than the value m. And we continue doing that. Whenever triples are all connected, we also include the triangle that they span and also for higher analogs. So what we end up with is a, a filtration of simplicial complexes, one simplicial complex included in the, in the next. I'm going to refer to this as a filter simplicial complex, which is, in this case, associated to um, the data set that we started with. And what persistence homology does is to extract robust invariants out of this, um, out of this um, multi-scale approximation to the data. So we go ahead and apply the homology functor. We, in persistent homology, always work over a field. And we obtain a so-called persistence module for any dimension d. Let's say that that is fixed. We obtain a persistence module, which is nothing but, in more categorical ter terms, a diagram of vector spaces. Now, the way that the dimensions of these vector spaces fit together uh, gives us a complete invariant of the persistence module, which is called its barcode. And it's illustrated. Here, for the example that we had before, in this color, I'm going to say green bluish color, we have um, the barcode associated to d equals 0 up there. And over here, we have the barcode associated to d equals 1. So this is quite familiar in machine learning. Um, in fact, keeping track of the uh, number of connected components, which is what uh, homology does in degree 0, is something very uh, much associated to clustering properties of the data set. So this was something that um, statisticians and machine learning practitioners were considering for a while. It's called a, a hierarchical clustering uh, signature or invariant of this point cloud. But what topology does is to allow us to extract the same kind of um, invariants, but now referring to higher notions of connectivity. And in this case, what uh, H1 is measuring, is measuring the presence of uh, of loops in our data. And what D or higher dimensions does is also to detect the presence of cavities in the, in the data. Now, why these barcodes are useful? Well, there are two reasons. The first one is that they are stable. And what do I mean by that? Is that the passage from point clouds, which are geometric objects, to barcodes, it's a, a continuous function that is Lipschitz. Over here, I'm measuring the distance between point clouds using the so-called Gromov-Hauser distance. And over here, I'm measuring the distance using um, the bottleneck distance, which is also a natural uh, construction when considering barcodes. So they're stable, so they provide a metric model for something much more complicated. And the other reason why they are uh, useful is that they are computable. Yeah, one second. Um, this computability comes from the fact that um, in order to extract this information, we only have to deal with the reduction of matrices. And we know that in the worst case scenario, that algorithm is n cube. But here we're dealing with very sparse matrices. So actually, it goes much faster. Yeah. 
Yeah, so great question. So I think the tension here appears from, I have a discrete collection of simplicial complexes, and over here I have a continuous parameter that is varying, right? The reason why I'm writing just a discrete over there is that since we have a finite number of points, the simplicial complex changes discreetly, right? And I'm only considering those as the simplicial complex that appear up there. But it's typical that we actually remember the values of the epsilon where those changes uh, occurred. Any other comments? Okay, great. So stability and computability. This is the this is the secret for why barcodes have become so popular. Now I would like to um, present an exemplar of using barcodes in a way that uh, we would try to imitate. Um, this is in the context of the study of nanoporous materials in chemistry, and this is not work that I've been um, involved with. This is before my time uh, coming into this field. And here there's a picture in lovely pink um, that is at uh, the level of 200 uh, nanometers, and we see that these uh, uh, materials have some very small pores. And we would like to understand the geometry of this um, of this pores. The issue is that there's a bunch of um, chemical compounds that are being listed with uh, having this uh, nanopores. And in fact, there are about 3 million structures. So if we want to compare um, the geometries of this uh, of the structures, it, it, it's impossible to do by hand. And so we need to have some ways of approximating the geometries of this um, of these materials and then compare those approximations. And barcodes provide us with a discrete model, an approximation to the, to the geometry. And we can compare barcodes much easier than compare geometries. That's an ill-defined problem, right? But we can compare the barcodes using this bottleneck distance that I mentioned before. And this is done fast and it's done faithfully because of this stability result. So we can say with confidence that if two barcodes are close, well, that's a good proxy for two geometries looking alike. And in fact, when this, uh, this team did this work, they were able to, able to identify different compounds that were listed, uh, sorry, I should say compounds that were listed as different compounds in this uh, um, data set that it turns out to be the same. So different teams have proposed them at different years and they didn't realize that they're actually the same compound. So look at those, they all look similar. This they all looks similar. Yeah. Did you define the barcode? I mean the bottleneck distance? No, I did not. I did not. I did not define the bottleneck distance. Oh. Yep. It's very to explain like how these uh, diagrams of the second and are related. Yeah. So this is this is not related to the barcodes. This is just the representation of the nanoporous materials. And, and the idea is to say, oh, this picture looks like this picture, uh, but they were listed as different compounds before um, people realized that their barcodes look the same. Let's see what's happening. Oh, they are actually. Okay, so this is TDA done right, an exemplar. Um, now, in order to do this kind of, of, of work, um, it would be very, um, it would be useful to have the tools available for a broader audience. Right? So machine learning practitioners did not necessarily have uh, the training or the backgrounds of the tools to use these generalizations of the hierarchical clustering um, um, signature. And right? so we thought that it was important to make that available. And in work that is in collaboration with the private sector, Oh, here's an example. I don't like the pinky. You know. <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, in collaboration with uh, the machine learning company L2F, we embark in this uh, technology transfer uh, project um, based when I was uh, working in Catherine Hess's lab, and also in collaboration with the REDS team that on hardware and fast implementations of things. We developed uh, this package, Kyoto TDA, which is a... Um, extension of scikit-learn, which is the most widely used uh, machine learning platform um, for traditional machine learning. So we made that available and uh, we're very happy with it. 
I encourage you if you want to start playing with this type of ideas to check it out. Okay, so I could not resist to have a little bit of a parenthesis here. It's, it's great how topology, a very theoretical thing, gave us tools in applied mathematics, but also this closes in a feedback loop because now we're taking some of the mature ideas in uh, persistent homology and we're able to come back and tackle problems in theoretical mathematics. I would like to give an example of how barcodes are, are being used in functional analysis. So Morse theory is another source of filtrations. So if we have a map from uh, X to the real numbers, then we can filter it by the sublevel sets. And barcodes, the existence of barcodes actually gives us Morse inequalities. It's a more general invariant, more informative invariant. And let me illustrate that with this picture. This is a very simple picture. The function that I have is just projecting to the horizontal line. And we have four critical points. You see the homology of this space is concentrated in the infinite bars. And when the birth and let me look at this. The birth and death of these bars occur precisely at critical points. OK, so that is the idea of, oh, barcodes are more informative than uh, Morse inequalities. You can derive Morse inequalities easily from the existence of a barcode. Um, but whenever we think about Morse theory, maybe immediately we go to the smooth case. But that's not all there is. Actually, Morse theory was uh, developed with uh, applications to general spaces that are not necessarily manifolds. Uh, for example, uh, Milner's book has uh, this example analyzing geodesics and the space of paths. Okay, so the example that I want us to look at is uh, motivated by this famous problem of plateau that asks for a minimal surface spanning a given boundary, a boundary curve. This was in the 1700s, and it was solved uh, fully by Douglas in 1930, extremizing a certain functional that he defined. So here we have a space of surfaces with a given uh, boundary G, and then he introduced a, a functional whose um, minima uh, were identifying minimal surfaces. Incidentally, he was awarded the first Fields Medal for this work. Now, another question that arises after Douglas' beautiful solution is the question for unstable minimal surfaces. So can we find critical points of the Douglas functional that are not extrema? And this is something that Morse embarked himself on solving. And a lot of the ideas from Morse theory come from, from this um, uh, line of work. So Morse and Tompkins use Morse inequalities and a lot more, okay, a lot more machinery, but particular Morse inequalities uh, to understand uh, the topology of this space omega g using the Douglas functional and answer positively uh, the unstable minimal surface question. And yes, there are unstable minimal surfaces. Is related to. It's not it, but it but is related. Yes. And the contribution that I would like to present here is uh, in joint work with uh, Bauer and Schmal, and we gave topological conditions for a broad family of maps um, like this that provides us with a barcode associated to the sublevel cell filtration of X, and in particular we can derive from them Morse inequalities. You can say, okay, fine, but what did we do with it? Uh, we fix Morse and Tomke's problem, uh, proof. We identify um, some claims that were not true, uh, and we use our understanding of the situation to fill those in. And the, um, the idea was to bring the proof of Morse and Tompkins, that is a very beautiful one, to a more rigorous and modern uh, format using um, the fact that persistent homology has grown into a more mature field. And this, yes? X exactly in this uh, setting? X? Oh, this X is a topological space. That's right, that's right. 
And in this application, uh, we took X to be the omega G that uh, is defined by the Douglas functional, right? So our contribution is more general. It's like we just describe topological conditions on the map that will give us barcodes and therefore more inequalities. And then we will check that um, this is an example of a functional that satisfies our conditions and therefore more inequalities are available and therefore the Morse and Tompkins argument goes through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the same way as before, because we have a filtration. So what we do is to apply homology to that filter space and we will get a diagram now of, um, of vector spaces parameterized by the reals. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so if I understand correctly, it's a uh, distribution uh, when continuous function, talk about the typical function. Yeah, but it's not even continuous. Huh? Uh, our, our conditions uh, um, only require this function to be uh, lower semi continuous. But the idea is to be yeah. That's right. It's, 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 to be, it's to be able to, not, not just that, it's to identify properties that will give us barcodes. And in particular, that are related to notions of uh, critical points. But this is not a well-defined notion if we don't have a smooth type of mani uh, uh, manifold. So there are generalizations and subtleties. All of that is uh, what this um, is kind of handling. And this is... So this F is an analog of the... Right, so this, this would be, uh, uh, I would call it a, a Morse function, yeah. right? But if it satisfies the topological conditions that, uh, that we require, so we're able to have Morse inequalities. But we do it through the existence of barcodes. So this is the nice thing, because Morse didn't have a structural thing. Persistent homology gives us a structural uh, invariant, the barcode. And from it, yes, kind of the shadow is we have Morse inequalities. And that's what was, used by Morse and Tompkins for the proof of the unstable minimal surface theorem. But unfortunately, that proof had a gap, which uh, we feel. And uh, I should also mention that um, this is uh, being considered, not this particular result, but this line of thought has also been considered in the context of floor type theories. OK, so I'm going to move on now to the third and last part. Unless you guys have more comments or so questions. Basically, your barcode can like replace If if we had smoothness and all of this situation, we we would have uh, something like yeah. But this is all done homotopically, so we have to um, don't rely on the smooth structure. What? Well, functional. Well, this is a functional analysis question, right? The existence of a minimal surface. Solution. Any other question? Okay. So third part. Let's see how we're doing on time. Yeah. This might be a little bit more demanding, but um, I hope we can motivate it well. And if not, again, the music. Um, before I go into the details, let me tell you what the payoff will be if you stick with me for the rest of the talk. We are going to introduce so-called steamrod barcodes. And what are this? Well, they are generalizations of the usual barcodes that carry the same nice properties. They are stable and they are computable. And uh, I'm also gonna show that they appear in real world data. So we actually provide concrete algorithms and implementations to use these tools. Here's an example of the type of output that um, our software gives us. This is a representation of a barcode where I'm only plotting the X and Y coordinates associated to the birthday, the birth time, and the death time. Right. So the farther we are from the diagonal, the longer the bar. Right? And we see that there are six points here that are far from the diagonal that we think of them as persistent features of um, of the uh, filter simplicial complex. In this case, the filter simplicial complex. Uh, we're going to return to this is a filtration on a cone and the suspension of S2 wedge S4. Don't, don't mind this. I'm going to return to it. And if you compare this barcode with this barcode, 
of a very different space, this is a cone and the suspension of the complex projective plane. Um, they look almost the same with the exception of this uh, diamond here. And this is the additional information that we're able to compute considering this generalization, the Steenrod barcode. So without them, we wouldn't be able to tell these two barcodes apart. With it, we are, okay? All right, so before I go into more details of how to construct this, do you guys have any comments or questions? All right, so let me start by highlighting some of the shortcomings of considering just petty numbers. So barcodes are based on just the dimensions of the vector spaces that appear in this diagram. Um, and those are the so-called Betty numbers. They are the same for homology and cohomology, um, but they forget a lot of structure. And some of that uh, structure, well, let, let's see why I make this claim. So here's an example of two um, spaces, no persistence right now, one fixed space, uh, the real projective plane and the width of a one sphere and a two sphere, this is the union of a circle and a sphere over a point. If we look at um, cohomology and we only consider Betty numbers, that means if we look at them as just graded vector spaces with mod two coefficients, then that invariant is not sufficiently powerful to tell these two different spaces apart. You might say, oh, that's because you were looking at mod two coefficients. What if you consider integral coefficients? Yes, integral coefficients would be sufficient to distinguish those two spaces, but um, then I will change the space. And I'll say, well, look at complex projective plane and the width of a two and a four sphere. Now with any coefficients, if you just look at the graded abelian groups, you won't be able to distinguish. And then you have taken topology and say, well, cohomology has more structure. These are rings. And you would be right if we look at the ring structure, it's different. But then I will change the question. <laughs> also, well, but if you take the suspension of these two spaces, then um, you would not be able to tell them apart. And I will say, but you will be able to tell them apart if you consider yet another layer, layer of structure, the one given by the action of the steamrod operations, in this case, steamrod squares, on cohomology. And that distinguishes them. So I'm going to describe how to define this additional structure, but first some intuition of the kind of additional information that they are capturing. So let's look at these two familiar spaces. We have on one hand the torus and the claim bottle with mod two coefficients. Uh, homo uh, cohomology as a graded vector space would not be able to tell them apart. Right? So what is then this additional structure? that um, we are after is represented here in terms of self-intersections. So if we look at this curve, and it's a curve because we're gluing these two sides one to another, and we take a displacement of it, a perturbation of the original one so, so that it is transverse to the first one, we can do that procedure um, without having intersections between the two curves, the original one and the displaced one. And that is reflected on the fact that the rank of the first Steenrod square is zero. Over here, if we do the same, if we start with a curve and then we displace it, we will always have an odd number of intersection points. Because this point is connected to that point, we're going to have to have self-intersection, um, non-trivial. And that is captured by the fact that the first in row square has rank one in this case. This is intuition for the uh, thing that we're after. So some, some topological twisting. And the question that I would like us uh, to ponder for the rest of this talk is, well, but how do we compute this product and steep road action concretely? Uh, so concretely that we can apply it in a persistent context, in a data science context. Um, okay, and this brings us to Kapai uh, co-products. What we need to do to compute these things explicitly is to have a family of maps of this form, here we have the chains on the simplicial complex to the tensor product of the chains with themselves. And this family of maps satisfy these homological conditions here. Essentially what they're doing is correcting broken symmetry of the previous one. Over here, T is the transposition given by 
permuting the two factors. Okay, so we want to have a first map that is not symmetric because if we permute, it's not the same, but then we want to have a second map that interpolates between those two. But if we take the transposition of that map, we get another one. Where we would like to have an interpolation between those two interpolations, so on and so forth. So this is the structure that we are after. And then if we have that structure, the product is given um, at the level of cohomology using representative uh, co-chains in this form. And the Steenroth squares are defined also using this um, Kapaiko products. Okay, so what we need is Kapaiko products. <laughs> Questions? Okay, so I would like to describe um, a new description of this Kapaiko products, what, what is sometimes called Steenroth construction. Um, and I did not have a lot of space in that slide, so I'm going to have to put a little piece of notation over here. So D, uh, say U, acting on this simplex B, say N, this is the usual face map. What it does to remove the vertex in position U, very familiar. Now, if I have a set of U's, U1, UK, uh, I'm, I'm going to write the sub U for just the composition D U1, D U, K. The most simple, I don't know if most simple, but it's a very natural um, uh, notation. That's the notation I'm going to use to define. Um, a new description for this Kapai uh, co-products. For any basis element, X, say of uh, dimension M, the ith co-product acting on it is given by acting on the left by D sub U something and acting on another uh, face operator associated to a set of integrals, integers. And what are these sets? Well, the sum is taking over all subsets of a given cardinality from um, uh, zero to n. And now this u zero and u one is a partition of the u into two subsets. And the first uh, element in this partition, the u zero, contains the elements in u whose value it's equal to its position modulo two. And the other one contains those whose value plus its position in U, it's uh, not the same module. Okay, so it's a natural partition. It's a very computer-friendly description. Right? And, and the claim is, uh, the implicit claim here is that this family satisfies that uh, homological uh, relations. Remember these homological relations? So uh, that's an implicit theorem here that I'm not claiming. That's a very good question. How about if we keep it up there and return to it? <laughs> um, so we have this, this formula. And the first thing that one would ask, especially uh, with Matthias factor is, is this formula different from the one given by Steenrod? At the level of formulas, yes, for sure. Right? But uh, Catalan numbers have all these different ways in which they can be uh, represented, but they give you the same thing at the end. Right? It's something like that happening here, that we just have different formulas that are actually giving the same mathematical object at the end. And the answer is yes. Um, all Kapai constructors, actually, in the literature, not just this one and the original of Steenrod, they all satisfy certain axioms. And uh, I prove that if those axioms are satisfied, then the two are isomorphic, where the notion of isomorphism is a very strict one. You're either the same at every i, or you're just the transposition of the other. Okay? So we have the same mathematical objects, and now the question would be, so what? What can we do with it? Um, oh, I had this, since this is a job talk, if you want to talk about other related things. <laughs> uh, there are connections about this stuff with higher category theory, Toric geometry, not theory, and condensed matter physics. Little parenthesis here. Um, 
Okay, but now to Matthias' question, what can we do with this that we couldn't do necessarily with um, the formulas that Steenrod introduced before? I pose to you that we can compute Steenrod squares faster for simplicial complexes. That's an, that's an important caveat. And I'm going to um, compare the existing implementation of this uh, routine that is part of Sage. This, I don't have to say what Sage is in this crowd here. Um, and the algorithm is based on a different construction of uh, kappa i coproducts. And uh, the task that I want us to compare is for a collection of spaces. Let's run both routines and see which one runs faster. That's all. What is the routine? We're going to compute SQ1 on e suspensions, iterated suspensions of RP2. Okay. Here in the y axis, we have the time it took, and in the x-axis, I'm plotting the number of simplices that a simplicial complex model of that iteration of the suspension applied to the real projective plane requires. So we have a model with 32 simplices for the real projective plane. We have a model with 74 for the suspension on it, on it and roughly it doubles the number of simplices that are needed as we suspend and suspend and suspend. Uh, yeah, and well, there's a clear winner here. Mine is the blue. <laughs> um, now, maybe, maybe in the question level, I can tell you why we see this kind of thing, but I'm going to move on because uh, of time constraints. Now, if we have a faster way of computing these things, well, this invites the application into topological data analysis, where performance is is king. So let's go back to our situation. We have a filter simplicial complex. And now the K steen row square, any steen row square, any cohomology operation, in fact, gives us uh, an endomorphism of the associated persistent cohomology module. Because of the naturality of the construction, we have um, all, diag all squares commuting here. And now we can define the SK barcode of that filter simplicial complex in terms of the image of this endomorphism. This, like in vector spaces, the image of a linear map is another linear map. The image of this endomorphism is another persistent module that has the barcode, and that's the barcode that I used to define um, the SQK barcode of the filter simplicial complex. And I will justify that if k is equal to zero, then this map is the identity. The image is the whole thing. So this will recover the original barcodes, but not if k is high. And the other, uh, uh, the important, two of the key things for the use of barcodes was they're stable and they're computable. Well, this generalization is stable after by Zoom, Emily, and myself. So we're still wondering if it is computable. And it is. We developed software uh, with the pink versions of my two authors, uh, Lupo and Tuzan, from, from the uh, team that I told you about before, the Jodo TDA team, that is a ready to use package that computes uh, Steenro barcodes pretty efficient. Um, and, well, do they help in real world problems? So, first, I would like to just illustrate um, synthetic data example because I presented it early on in the talk. Let's consider filtrations on the cone of these two spaces. And I will say they're not the actual spaces, they're simplicial complex models of those spaces, right? And then we take um, a filtration some some random order of the of the simplices. And as I said before, our gives us these two barcodes uh, that can be, um, that illustrate that these two spaces are different. Notice that the cone though makes them contractible. So if you just use uh, the uh, the infinite bars, if you just look at the cohomology there, you wouldn't see anything, no matter how fine your tool is. Um, but the fact that these are persistent things, we still see uh, interesting information despite the uh, final uh, spaces being contractible. Okay, now to an application from the real world. This comes from the space of conformations of the cyclooctane molecule. I'm going to think of this um, problem as uh, a point cloud. And what is the problem? 
to understand the ways that this molecule embeds into uh, um, R3. So the different ways that chemists are encountering this molecule, and they mostly care about the positioning of the carbon atoms. So we're going to have three times eight um, coordinates. And for every one of those, we have a point cloud. Right? Now we run our um, pipeline, the Vitoris Rifts. So we extract this um, filter complex, and we apply usual um, um, persistent cohomology. And I'll tell you after the question. Yeah, there's, there's some redundancy here, yes. Um, and in green, we see the output of uh, traditional persistent cohomology, which is the same as homology, okay? I'm using cohomology, but at the level of Betty numbers, at the level of usual barcodes, there's, there's no difference. There's an isomorphism between the, the two things. So we see this long feature here, an H1 feature here, this other feature that is kind of a little bit more stable, but still very noticeable. And we also see a degree two, a noticeable and, and stable persistent feature. So then we could say, what would be a good um, sub -manif uh, manifold approximation, say two dimensional manifold approximation if we have this data? Um, what would be you know, a good description of the shape in which this is um, concentrating around? And if you see this, you say, oh, it's probably like a torus. But there's another option too, right? Could be a claim bottle. And it, by chemists, it was believed uh, that it should be a claim bottle. And uh, we offer more evidence to that by considering the first Steenrod square, because this barcode is non trivial. And as we saw at the beginning, this is a telltale difference between the claim bottle and the, uh, and the torus. And as I said, this offers more evidence to uh, what chemists already suspected. And with that said, I thank you for your attention. I'm open to any questions you have. Thank you, Anibal, for that uh, wonderful talk. Are there any questions? Talk a little bit about why you're messing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, let me hear a couple of questions, and, and then I see the right order. So if you, if you look at the Square. Yeah, great question. So let me uh, take that one first. <laughs> I'm going to return to, to this other one in a second. Um, the um, what we looked at here was steamroll squares, which are cohomology operations at mod two, right? So the first thing that one would say, what about mod p? Uh, and yes, uh, in fact, this is this is work that we're currently pushing forward. Before we came into the scene, um, we didn't even have analogs of the cap i products for uh, steamroll operations at odd primes. So the first thing that we contributed to this discussion is, oh, here are analogs of the cap i products that represent at the co-chain level or at the chain level steamroll operations at odd primes. And uh, we are we're not yet. Those are not the right ones for this kind of heavy duty computations yet, but we're actually in the process of finding better cup I products representative. Um, and that is connected to knot theory in a way, and as I mentioned before. Now, you also ask about um, messy products. One drawback uh, is uh, the people have looked into this and, and they have said this, well, there's a natural uh, A infinity structure appearing here, we should try to include it. But those become uncomputable. They're very hard to compute in practice. And, and uh, the type of thing that I'm after and people here is not just to define things, but it's also to use them in concrete examples. Now, why um, was this uh, graph there? Um, we have something like. So the main reason is that this uh, algorithm is heavily dependent on the number of simplices of the simplicial complex. As you increase the number of uh, simplices, 
this thing grows with it. And as we saw, this was growing exponentially, so this is growing kind of exponentially too. This guy does not depend so much on the number of simplices. It depends more um, on the number of simplices in the support of the co-cycle that is representing the cohomology class that you're analyzing. So if you have a representative that is very short, then it doesn't matter that it's living in a big, 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 big space. The thing that is most important is the length of the, of the representative. And we are tweaking our algorithms to actually find better representatives from, from this viewpoint. If we're able, this is a very interesting question actually in applied topology. So you have this bars, you can choose representatives, but you also have a lot of freedom in order to choose your representative for cohomology classes. And we would like to have representatives with the smallest possible support because our algorithms depend on that. So in light of what you just said, would I expect also that your software would perform better with respect to memory than I haven't made that um, that computation, but I think I think there is a trade-off uh, also. Um, I think we are heavier on on, on memory and on, on the than this other algorithm. Finally, uh, is it obvious or not obvious that you can parallelize your um, yeah, so the parallelization question is a big one in, in TDA, and they're very different steps. Uh, the first step, the, the barcode, is the same for both of ours, and that is tricky. Uh, they're not good parallelization methods yet. They're things based on spectral sequences that might yield um, gold, but we're not there yet. Our method uh, is very parallel with respect to each of the cohomology classes that you're analyzing. So it's, it's um, completely parallelized. But I, I would say that the main issue is still in the first stage to compute uh, the, the cohomology representatives. Yeah. Other questions? Let's take any call again. Thank you.